Knauf. If you dive anything like me, then you're absolutely mad for them, whether they be Suez, Plus, or Root. But today I'd like to talk about my absolute favourite, the Ingrinol Canal. The Ingrinol Canal is a path through the anterior abdominal wall that allows structure to move between the abdominal cavity and the external genitalia. Now the abdominal wall is composed of several layers, so to help us visualise it, I'm going to imagine we've taken a slice just here, and we're looking down at it from above. So we'll have the medial aspect here, the lateral aspect here, with anterior at the bottom of the screen, and posterior at the top. The layers of the abdominal wall pass across this space. First we have the transversalis fascia, which will be covered by peritoneum on its deep aspect. Then we have the three muscular layers, the transversus abdominis, the internal oblique, and the external oblique. All three of these layers appear laterally of muscle fibres, but if they head medially, they form thin, flat tendons known as aponeuroses. The tendon of external oblique just heads towards the midline as you'd expect, but the tendons of internal oblique and transversus abdominis come together to form a single strong structure known as the conjoint tendon. The inguinal canal needs to pass through each of these layers. It starts internally at the deep inguinal ring, an oval deficiency in the transversalis fascia found at the midpoint of the inguinal ligament. It then passes anteriorly and medially through the muscular layers, finishing with an opening in the aponeurosis of external oblique, known as the superficial inguinal ring. This can be found just superior to the pubic tubercle. Although useful, having an opening through the abdominal wall creates a potential weakness. Consequently, the inguinal region is a common site of herniation. The anatomy of the canal attempts to reduce this risk. For example, it runs obliquely. So when the muscular layers contract and pull closer together, deficiencies in one layer are reinforced by other layers. In particular, the strong conjoint tendon sits just behind the superficial ring, providing extra reinforcement to this portion of the abdominal wall. Despite this, inguinal hernias can still happen. Externally, these hernias appear at the superficial inguinal ring. However, there are two routes they can take to get there. Indirect inguinal hernias take the long route, with the hernia being pushed into the deep inguinal ring, along the canal, and out through the superficial ring. These are normally congenital, and often recur as a result of the canal failing to close properly during development. Direct hernias take the shortest and most direct route to the superficial ring, pushing straight through the layers of the abdominal wall. These tend to be acquired and occur when weak abdominal muscles meet increased intra-abdominal pressure. The classic example would be an outer-shaped guy straining to lift weights in the gym. Surgically, the two types of hernia can be differentiated by their relationship to a group of vessels known as the inferior epigastric. These can be found at the mid inguinal point, halfway between the aphis and the pubic symphysis. If we add those to our illustration, we can see that direct hernias pass medially to these vessels, whereas indirect hernias occur laterally. So, that's the major layers of the abdominal wall and the course of the inguinal canal. Once you've got the hang of these, I'd start looking at the structures that travel through the canal, and in the male, how these layers relate to the coverings of the spermatic cord. If you have any questions, please get in touch. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and I'll hopefully see you again soon. Cheers!